Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the Sustainable CT Coffee Hour today. Uh, we're just going to wait on for one second as people continue to join. Thanks for being with us today. All righty, so let's get started. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to today's Sustainable CT Coffee Hour. Uh, today's coffee hour is going to be all about composting uh, in Connecticut. We're super excited about it. We've been working on this all summer, so thank you so much to everyone who's here joining us today. Before we get started, a um, couple of things. Well, first of all, my name is John Henry Burke. I'm the uh, uh, Northwest Hills Council of Governments Fellow. Um, and a couple of things before we get started. So first, this coffee hour is going to be recorded for those who uh, can't be here today or for those of you who are here, if you want to look back on anything we covered today. You'll be able to find this and all of our coffee hours, along with recordings of workshops, certification help, newsletter previews, and a great deal more on our YouTube channel. Search YouTube for Sustainable CT and you'll find us there. We'll also drop a link in the chat. Uh, you also find a direct link to our YouTube channel in our monthly newsletter, Actions and Impact. A link to our current newsletter will also be put in the chat. Please check it out. We try and keep it fun and informative. Uh, you know, if for some reason you're not receiving it, you can easily subscribe at sustainablect.org by clicking the sign up button at the very bottom of the page. And while you're at our website, be sure to check out The Impact, a sustainable CT podcast. We'll put that in, link in the chat also. Look for uh, the new episode, which came out today. Uh, it's going to be, you can find that on sustainablect.org or wherever you get your podcasts. And we'd like to ask you to save the date. The 2024 Sustainable CT Award Celebration will be on Wednesday, November 13th. We'll be honoring all of our 2024 certified towns and a brand new cohort of climate leaders. We'll also be celebrating five years of community match fund success, which will make it extra special. So what's really cool is we're going to be doing that celebration at the Catherine Hepburn Cultural Arts Center, the Kate in Old Saybrook. So this cultural arts center is a nonprofit performing arts organization located in a historic theater on Main Street in Old Saybrook. Originally opened in 1911, the building's now listed on the National Register of Historic Places. The Catherine Hepburn Museum located on the first floor is the only museum of its kind honoring Catherine Hepburn, Old Saybrook's most celebrated resident. So space is limited, so we encourage you to register early at sustainablect.org, and we'll put a link in the chat for that as well. Your hard work and continuing support are of vital importance to us, so we look forward to seeing all of you at the K in Old Saybrook on November 13th. So one more thing, I know you're here to talk about compost, and we're going to start talking about compost. And one last thing um, is if you have any questions at all uh, throughout this webinar, we're going to ask you to drop those in the chat as soon as they come to you. Uh, and then at the end, we're going to have a Q&A session where we're just going to read down the list. We're going to try and answer as many questions as possible. But definitely, we, uh, we encourage you to drop those questions in the chat as we go throughout the webinar today. So now that we've got all that out of the way, let's get rolling on today's Sustainable CT Coffee Hour Tackling the Waste Crisis in Connecticut Municipal Organic Waste Initiatives. Dylan, take it away. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Dylan. I'm also a Sustainable CT Fellow this year. I'm with WestCog. And uh, I'm going to be telling you a little bit about the background for CT's waste crisis and what prompted us to uh, tackle organics waste diversion in the first place as our group project this year. 
Um, so as many of you may know that in 2022, the Mira trash incineration site in Hartford shut down. Uh, this left only four incineration plants in the state. Um, the map on the right shows these plants. Um, and there are currently no plans to build additional incinerators as they're costed to build with relatively short operating periods of about only 30 years. Um, CT residents currently produce about 2.4 million tons of waste every year, uh, with 40% of our trash being shipped out of state, to states like Ohio, Pennsylvania, and Maryland, uh, leading to higher disposal fees that are passed on to municipalities and the residents. Uh, tipping fees for drivers that, uh, that truck these loads will only get uh, higher as the problem worsens, and these trucks also contribute greatly to greenhouse gas emissions during their long hauling journeys. Uh, and we're here to talk about solutions. So what we found is in order to reduce costs and environmental damage, there's really a simple solution. Reduce. Uh, policies that can be adopted to further this goal include unit-based pricing for trash pickup and organics diversion. Uh, unit-based pricing has proven to be extremely effective in reducing household waste in towns like Stonington, Connecticut. Uh, unit-based pricing introduces a pay-as-you-throw system to residents. And if you're curious about this, uh, please check out Sustainable CT Action 9.2 and our website for additional resources. Uh, but today, we're here to talk about uh, organics diversion, um, the focus of today's presentation and the municipal policies slash programs that you can do to promote it. Uh, organics make up a plurality of what makes up household waste at a whopping 40% of uh, households on average. Uh, Connecticut has some incredible programs that we'll be showcasing here today to show you how we can best confront the waste crisis. Moving on. What's up? It's me again. So I wanted to give you some context as to how we got here today. So first of all, um, Sustainable CT has this really awesome summer fellowship program. And that is where college students uh, like myself or, or recent graduates are, are placed in different uh, council of governments throughout the state and then they're tasked with assisting the towns in that region with certification community mass fund projects you know any like sustainability related stuff they got going on but in addition to that the fellows are also tasked to with one group summer project so this was kind of our big group summer pro project that we all kind of collaborated on throughout the summer um and this project can be broken down into a couple parts. So we started with a inventorying all of the municipal composting projects that are happening throughout the state. And this kind of helped us to kind of get a lay of the land, to kind of gain an understanding of the, um, the, 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 the landscape of composting in Connecticut and kind of what's going on, you know, what's working well, where are towns seeing challenges? Um, and it was very informative. And so then we kind of took this information, we kind of picked one standout project from each region of the state. And we chose to, to highlight those projects further in uh, a series of fact sheets. And so those fact sheets are really great. They, they detail funding information. They detail you know what kind of challenges these projects ran into. And those fact sheets are gonna be publicly available on our website soon after this webinar. So you're definitely gonna to wanna to check those out. Um, we, overall, we thought this was gonna be a great way for towns to learn from other towns, you know? Uh, and, and it also kind of allowed us to uh, collect some pretty cool data on, on what's going on in the world of composting in Connecticut. And so for more on that, I'm gonna turn it over to Bridget. Good morning, everyone. I'm Bridget Arquat. I'm a fellow in River Cog this summer. And I just wanted to start off by saying that to the best of our knowledge, this data is as accurate as, as it can be. Um, there might be some gaps in the data because we gathered it by interviewing and scouring the internet, uh, but overall very comprehensive. So when it comes to those numbers, 78 out of 169 municipalities have organics diversion projects that are either current, planned, or piloted. Um, 72 of those municipalities are ongoing projects. Um, there are four additional municipalities that are planning for future programs, and there are nine total municipalities that have future plans. That discrepancy just comes from the fact that many towns, many municipalities are planning multiple projects. So, um, 
there's an overlap to some degree. There are two additional municipalities that are currently piloting programs. And just to tack on to that, eight municipalities have discontinued their projects with 12 total projects discontinued overall. And then just in terms of the total number of projects, I already discussed a little bit of the overlap and how many municipalities have multiple projects going on. There are 118 unique ongoing organics diversion projects across Connecticut. And we can move on to the next visual. Great. So this is a visual just describing the frequency of composting program by type. We don't have every single slice in the pie aggregated out here, but once we add this to the fact sheet, you should be able to see every single program type, but I'll leave that for a second just so that everyone can take a look at it. And then one more thing I wanted to say is that we wanted to display numbers on funding, but because the programs are so diverse, it was really hard to generalize um, by creating average cost, average startup, average operation cost, it would have just been maybe a little bit misleading because some programs are, are really huge with like hundreds of thousands of dollars in, in startup costs and operation costs, while others are, are very, very small. Um, but we're hoping to add some more detailed information to the fact sheets. And one other thing that I wanted to tack on is a lot of our data is qualitative too, which can't be just simply aggregated and thrown onto the screen. So in our composting inventory, a lot of it is information on general successes and general challenges that we hope comes through in the fact sheets. Hello, everybody. I'm Rebecca Stanton, one of the River Cog Fellows this summer, and I'll be briefly going over trends we saw in terms of successes and challenges. So for su successes, some trends that we have noticed is that many towns are funding their food scrap collection through their town budget and are aware of how important having food scrap collection programs run by the town are. Another trend is that towns who have made their food scrap collection more user-friendly for residents oftentimes have more successful programs. Lastly, for successes, we found that regional resource recovery authorities, are, which are authorities that help with waste management, have been very instrumental in several COGS and towns for their success. For challenges, there was a trend in towns having difficulty in getting residents to participate and especially coming up with incentives for residents to participate. Also on the resident side, uh, municipalities have been struggling to educate the residents on what is compostable and what is not. And of course, there has been struggles regarding reliable funding, particularly for small towns. And lastly, there has been issues and worries about attracting bears and other critters through the composting. I will now pass it to Ella to introduce our first speaker. Hello everyone, my name is Ella Burns de Mello. Sorry if there's any background noise, they happen to be doing some mowing outside. Um, I'm a sustainable CT fellow with West Cog this summer, and I'm very excited to be introducing our very first speaker, Jennifer Eaton-Jones. Jen is the executive director of the Housatonic Resources Recovery Authority, which serves 14 municipalities in Western Connecticut. Today, she'll be talking to us a little bit about HRA, known as Hurrah, as well as Ribbed Solar Powered Powered Aerated Stag Pile Composting Facility. That being said, if you have any questions for Jen or any of the other speakers, please drop them in the chat. Uh, Jen, thank you for joining us today. I'll pass it off to you. Good morning. Thank you. And I also have mowing in the background, so hopefully you won't be able to hear it. Um, so thank you for having me. I'm excited to share um, HRRA's story. You can go to the next slide. So I do wanna share first that we are really excited that HRA is celebrating 10 years of organic diversion from the waste stream. We actually started in 2014 and uh, there we had the first of its kind municipal collection, curbside collection program and that ended up turning into a municipal drop-off program. Next slide. And these programs are pretty easy and simple for our residents. They just bring their food scraps to a recycling center or one of our transfer stations and they drop off the contents in a designated container. Next slide. We started out in Bridgewater, Connecticut, and uh, I'm proud to show that we actually have nine programs now, all the way from North and, and Kent. We're going to hear from Jean Speck to as south as Wilton 
and Weston. Next slide. One of the things that we discovered over the years of building these municipal drop-off programs was that um, the biggest obstacle is the cost of transportation and disposal. So we really needed to find a solution to be more self-sustainable. And that's when we moved towards building the first uh, solar powered ASP system in Ridgefield. And we are now building our second one in Newtown, which we'll get into the details of. Next slide. And before we talk about that, I will say that our next project um, because we did find that residents often would complain that the local transfer stations really aren't convenient um, to access given the limited days of, uh, and hours of operation, depending on the size of the municipality. So we are looking to place uh, satellite locations around our region using the Metro store locked containers. And I have the next slide shows what the Metro store looks like. And the next slide. We'll go on to talk a little bit more about this Ridgefield ASP system. Uh, we did receive a USDA grant in 2021, along with the Recycle CT Foundation Lee Sawyer grant. We started in 2021, next slide. And our goal of the project was to create a self-sustainable closed loop composting system for transforming residential food waste into an end product for our community and for our agricultural um, farmers, et cetera, in our, in our community. The project was to demonstrate the municipalities can manage food waste locally, reduce the carbon footprint of offsite disposal, and contribute to the waste diversion goals of the state. This project uses an aerated static tile, ASP, composting process. The mixture of the carbon, which is leaves, in our case, in, in Ridgefield, and nitrogen, which is our food scraps, are placed on a solar-powered ASP piping system. The solar panels power a time blower, which forces air into the perforated piping, which circulates air through the composting pile. And the system maintains proper moisture and oxygen levels needed to produce the high quality compost. So this project increases access to compost for residents, community garden groups, our local farmers, as an alternate to synthetic fertilizers. And it also provides the municipality as well with readily available compost. Um, it can use it for storm water management and, er and erosion control. Uh, next slide, please. This, I just wanted to highlight that a lot of our, um, the items that we used or the supplies that we used were sustainable. The concrete footings that you see holding the solar panels up are made from positive, um, from urban mining, which is recycled glass. Next slide. So throughout the whole project, we hired, this is Jeff Demers. He's the owner and operator of New England Compost out of Danbury. Uh, he was actually my inspiration for this project. Many, many years ago, long before I got the grant, I had wanted to do this, but I didn't have the funding until the USDA um, released the, their urban um, composting grant. And this is essentially what Jeff has at his business where he makes compost for a living. He has a solar powered ASP. Um, so he, because he had an extensive experience, we hired him as our consultant paid through um, the USDA grant. Next um, slide. So, um, and when I get to the lessons learned, some of it is you don't always know everything you need to purchase. Um, when you've written for the grant. So we found like, oh, we need a safety fence. Jeff didn't have one because it wasn't open to the public. It's just on his property for his business. So we needed a safety fence to maintain um, safety for our, our the general public in case they went to this area. And we needed a housing shed for the batteries and the timer. And so that fence is actually donated by a local fence company, but not a new fence. They repurposed the fence. And then the shed was, all of the supplies for the shed was donated by a local a hardware store, Ridgefield Supply, and the entire system was put together by volunteers. Next slide. This is just a photo of Public Works getting involved and being a part of the process and helping us build the ASP system. It was really important that Public Works being that eventually they were going to be the ones running the system, that they were part of building it as well. Next slide. So the entire area that we are using for the ASP system is about a half an acre. 
Um, the system is a three and a half kilowatt um, system. Essentially, it could power a small home with three bedrooms. That, is, that gives you kind of an idea. And we're permitted to process 12 cubic yards of food scraps per month. Next slide. So we set the first pile in August of 2022. Um, this was Public Works again, working with Jeff Demers. You can't see him, but he's in the he's in he's there. He's just not in the photo, um, guiding them to tell them how to set the pile and how to set the mix. Uh, basically, three of one. Next um, slide. We're going to start to get into how does an ASP system actually work. So you're going to see the pipes are through the system, and then. Um, this is Jeff talking about this, the system. This is a, it's a bouncy house blower that forces air into the pile. Um, so the timing is really important. So the next slide with the housing, this is what looks like what's inside the shed. Um, we introduced the air into the compost pile and we're able to basically maintain that aerobic condition without turning the pile by pushing that air through and it optimizes the biology of the compost process and it manages the pile temperature, believe it or not. Um, and we're able to sort of gauge the desired range that we need by adjusting the air and the, the amount of air and the timing of the air. And of course, um, it, without Jeff, we wouldn't have understood or known like what we needed to do and, and, and depending on the density of our pile, how much air we needed to push through. Um, it also reduces a sense of odors, um, especially you don't want our neighbors to complain. And it does, I mean, the whole idea of an ASP system is to expedite the rate of the composting process and then ultimately reproduce high quality compost. And then so after 30 days, we that pile is sitting on the pipes, we pull the pipes out. We don't move the pile, we pull the pipes out. Um, then we move the pile to another set of pipes and then it sits there for about two weeks. Um, and then we take it off to cure. So next uh, slide. This is just um, another view at what's happening. The three parameters that we're looking for is a nutrients balance, uh, what is often thought of as, you know, the carbon nitrogen ratio of mix. And then the second is the bulky density of the mix, which is an indication of the measure of the porosity and our ability to push the air up through that pile. And then the third is the moisture content, um, which is most critical of the three. Um, we want our moisture content to be about 60 to 65% in the initial mix because we're going to be losing moisture over that 30 days. And we want to make sure we have sufficient moisture for the compost to process and, um, and it doesn't stall out. Uh, next slide. Um, so, just taking a little bit closer look at the biofilter cover. First, it serves as an insulating layer so that all the material in the raw mix reach a pile temperature sufficient to destroy pathogens and parasites and weed seeds. And then second, equally more as important, is that the layer serves as an odor control for biofiltration. And then third, is, the third reason is that re nutrient retention and um, it helps with moisture retention. And ultimately that layer um, a finished compost helps improve the aesthetics as well. Next slide. And then we're talking about benefits here. With the SP, we're able to reduce the footprint of an active compost pad. So like a, a typical windrow system, um, if we were using one, we would need a lot more space. It, it, we actually reduce the, the amount of space or acreage that we need three to six times, depending on the type of equipment we're going to be using. Um, it, and there's an increase in the site capacity as well um, because we're going up in the pile rather than out. And it does resolve offsite odor impacts with neighbors because we're not turning the pile like a windrow system that releases the odor within the pile. We're keeping the, the pile static. And um, there is a cost in reduction for um, processing because we're using less labor and equipment and less fuel during the active phase of composting. Next slide. So this is just some quick photos of some of the parts of the program. So we also purchased a trommel that screens out any large pieces of carbon like wood chips and our compostable bags that we do allow in our program that maybe haven't broken down and we might actually reintroduce that. Um, if you could go to the next slide. 
This is just uh, residents utilizing the program at Ridgefield. We have a lot of signage. If you look on the far left on top of the container, you see a QR code. We also ask our residents to scan that code and enter data that's really simple. It just says, yes, I dropped off today. I, I dropped off a full bin, a half a bin, a quarter bin, just to kind of give us an idea of, um, you know, what are we collecting and how often are folks dropping it off. Next slide. We are working towards the future of partnering with our local com curbside compost companies. In this instance, it's the company's curbside compost. It brought us some residential curbside material. Um, this will also be a great partnership, not only to reduce carbon footprint for our local haulers to not have to take it, you know, within the 20 mile radius of a permitted facility, but to also help us build revenue um, to maintain the system in the future. Next slide. We did have a compost cover, um, so it protects the active curing process of our pile in case there was excess rain. Um, it also prevents the excess moisture conditions of the pile and it not releasing. So it's not adding water and it's not taking away water. So it, it's a protector. Um, next slide. I don't know how much time I have left, so I apologize. I can't really see the clock. Um, so this is just our finished compost on the left. The right side is actually where it was curing. So after it came off the pipe, it went through the screener, it sits there, and then it goes to um, being able to give it away to our community, which is the next slide, which is really exciting to share that Ridgefield produced and distributed over 70 cubic yards of finished compost in 2023. And in just this year, since January, we've gone over 90 cubic yards to date. Um, so it's a total of 160 cubic yards of compost distributed to our community, our garden groups, our residents, the municipality has used it, Park and Rec has used it, um, we've given it to some farmers, it's, it's really exciting. So uh, next slide, a few lessons learned. So um, data, just, you know, I'm sure if anyone has done some projects like this, um, Data is required with our grants. It's essential, but it's not always accurate. Um, for example, as I have here, like we have residents who are participating in the program but never signed up, so we really can't track them. Or we have residents who want to use the program um, and it's vice versa, and they don't end up, they signed up, but they don't end up using the program. So it's really hard to gauge um, accurate data. Um, the cost of the material, I kind of mentioned before, we didn't, there's things we didn't plan for like that fence or the housing shed or in this example here is we didn't know we were need an engineering stamp that was going to be $600 and um, the permit from deep was $500 so uh, lessons learned there's a lot of unknown costs so you have to plan for that um, and then planning for success um, starting small you know how, how do you how do you determine if you want to start small and go slow and the benefits and pros and cons to that versus the fact that you need to plan for the success. So if the, the project is successful, have you built it to scale that it can serve your entire community, not just a small pilot project? Um, so that was also a lesson learned. So in Newtown, we've, we're building a much larger ASP system than we did in Ridgefield. Um, last slide. One that everyone wants to know, how much did it cost and how much money did you get? Um, how much money we got is not necessarily the cost of the project. If you look at the very top of the right chart, the ASP system itself is only $18,000. Um, and then the housing shed, of course, it was donated, but it was worth about $2,000 and the fence, et cetera. And you can go down this list, but not everything was absolutely required. Like we didn't have to buy a skid steer. We didn't have to buy a screener. The town had those um, that equipment. The re reason we did purchase it is we wanted it to be designated for the project and not take away from the town using equipment that may needed to be used for another project throughout the town. And uh, with the screener, the feedback from Public Works was, yeah, we could use the screener and we could just buy a new screen because um, you need a smaller screen uh, size for compost than you do for maybe other things that they're screening out wood chips, um, but it's labor intensive and time consuming to switch out those screens. So given that we had the grant, we just purchased the screener to be designated just for the compost. And we did learn through that process that we should have bought a, a larger screener 
um, so that we could, now that we've grown in capacity of finished compost, we can't run enough compost through that screener that's at time efficient. Um, so we, next time I would apply for a much more money for a much larger screener. Um, the funding came from the first round in USDA grants in 2021. We did apply for a second USDA grant and was awarded another 43,000, which actually helped us buy that screener. Um, the local Boy Scouts gave us $1,000 and we, we did receive that Lee Sawyer Recycle CT Grant Foundation, which helped actually build the actual ASP um, solar power system. And then we had a lot of in-kind donations. Uh, for instance, uh, the consultant, Jeff Demers, he donated half of his time pro bono and we paid him the other half. Um, so I'm happy, that's it. Um, the last slide is just my contact information and happy to answer questions when you are all ready. Awesome, thank you so much, Jennifer. That was amazing. Uh, we're now gonna move on to our next speaker, Jean Speck. Uh, she's a senior regional planner from the Northwest Hills Council of Government, um, but she's here today because she's also the former first select woman of Kent and who started the composting program at Kent during her time there. Uh, so, Jean, thank you so much for being here. Again, if you have questions, drop them in the chat and we will get to them at the end of the webinar. Great. Thanks, John Henry. And shout out to NH Cog. Thanks so much, John Henry. You did an amazing job over the summer. Appreciate it. Um, so I became first selectman in Kent in November of 2019 after 10 years at the Department of Public Health. Um, when people ask me about uh, my four years as the chief elected official was, I like to use a line from one of my favorite movies, which you can probably guess. I often say it was like rabid foxes, pandemics, and composting. Oh, my. <laughs> Um, it was a whirlwind. Nobody tells you what a whirlwind it's going to be. And if somebody had said to me in November of 2019, garbage, composting, source separating glass are going to be your biggest um, love and <laughs> what you get, what just like makes you spark, I would call them a liar. But here I am. <laughs> So, um, oh, you can go to the next slide. I should say beep. Um, looking back, it's surprising when I made this timeline, I was sort of shocked at how quickly we were able to stand up the program. Um, this was largely due to the previous speaker. Um, Jen Heaton Jones, the support and leadership she provided um, was, I can't say enough about her. I'll get teary eyed if I if I talk too long. By the end of we had a meeting in, I think it was probably late November, early December. She came up to the town hall just to meet me and meet with me because we were part of HRRA. And by the end of that meeting, um, where she explained to me trash, garbage, the waste crisis, home co composting versus commercial composting, source separating glass. Um, by the end of that meeting, she had sparked a fire in me about how reducing what goes into our kitchen garbage cans is one of the most important keys to solving this waste crisis. Um, it was a great conversation. And then the pandemic happened. So fast forward to 2021, and we started still informally talking about the possibility of doing a pilot program. And Jen, I can't, you'll have to remind me. In there somewhere, we also started that glass source separation pilot, which was a great success. And obviously, we're still doing that. Um, key to the discussion was obviously our transfer station manager, Rick Osborne, who is also our um, public works director. And one of the um, two of the main things that he was able to bring was like Jen and I were talking about the conceptual of you know, why we want to do this and how it's going to reduce waste. Um, but he was able to bring that logistical and operational piece to it where he would sort of, you know, tap on the brakes and let us know that, no, you can't actually do that because there's no room on the property to do that. Or, you know, we need to move it here, or, you know, things like that. So he was a great partner in that. 
Um, once we were awarded the grant in 2023, part of the grant was to hire a coordinator. So if that person was paid for um, with the grant, um, Tiffany Carlson, I don't know if Tiffany's on the call today, um, but she was, I think of her as sort of our um, cheerleader captain slash special sauce slash um, composting whisperer <laughs> at our at our uh, transfer station um, to get really get the program off the ground and, you know, just move things. She just kept moving, moving things forward. She was the person who was like, yep, we're going to solve this problem. Yep. We're going to solve this problem. Yep. We're going to solve this problem. And again, it goes, again, goes back to Jen, your leadership and just your positive outlook on, we can solve this in little ways to make a big impact was, I will never forget it. Um, you can go to the next slide. So the devil is in the details. Boy, was the devil in, in the details. Um, critical to this was public messaging. Public messaging, public messaging, public messaging. Um, HRR, HRA held three, um, what Jen calls trash talks, where we talked about trash. She talked about the waste crisis in Connecticut, what diversion represents of the total, why it's important to divert as much we can um as much as we can and there were a lot of questions about you know why do we have to do this even even after she explained why we really need to do this and jen has this amazing way about meeting people where they are and in kent as in a lot of connecticut towns there are um you know we have a large contingent of weekenders a large con contingent of um part time so part time they live in the city part time they live in here in Kent and helping them understand that you don't just put your garbage down a chute in an apartment building and it magically goes away or you put it in a trash can um at the curbside and it just magically goes away that it's you know there's more to it here um i believe yes i believe those were recorded sorry the um that just popped up in the chat um and so she was able to meet people sort of where they are. We also have a lot of farmers. We also have a lot of people who do home composting. There were a lot of questions about, well, I home compost, so I don't need to do it commercially with at the transfer station. Um, so being able to meet all the different pockets of people was, I think, another piece of that success for us. And, you know, if we had just sent out a few email blasts and had you know, one in-person town hall type of thing. I don't think we would have been successful because there were so many, you know, when when you're sort of forcing change on people, um, people start to push back and they get really, really far down in the weeds of the why and the why me and why is the government making me do this and really getting down there in the weeds with them. Um, Jen and Tiffany and myself and Rick, we were able to sort of meet the people where they needed to be met to answer their questions to help them. Um, one of the aha moments that we had was um, when Jen, we were having trouble sort of getting people to understand why, why composting um, is important and why it should be important to each resident. And one day she explained to me, she said, well, take your electricity bill. If you, let's say you live next door to somebody who has nine kids and um, you had to pay for part of their electricity bill, how would you feel about that? And I was like, I pay for someone else's electricity bill. I turn all the lights off in my house. My house is at like 60 degrees in the dead of winter and it's so that I can save electricity so that my bill stays low and it was like this crazy light bulb moment and every single time I have retold that little correlation that's one of those key moments where people are like oh why I, why am I paying for someone else's garbage so that helped with the the sort of the tethering of what we call in Kent, save as you throw or pay as you throw, and how it is tethered to the composting, um, that you're controlling your garbage that you put into the system. You're not just 
paying the same as everybody else. So that was a big aha moment. Um, another aha moment was during implementation, um, Tiffany and Jen were on site. I think Jen was at seven weeks, seven weekends. Um, so our transfer station is only open on Saturdays and Sundays. They were there, I believe it was seven weekends from the, the date of launch. And they were talking to individuals, answering a lot of questions, um, talking to people about the different supplies and equipment that we were offering. And I think that was a real key to having success for the program was having that like one-on-one -on -one touch point with people. And the feedback that we got from people was all positive. Like, oh, thank goodness. I'm so glad that there was somebody there on scene on site that was able to answer my questions that day that I was there. Because everybody has, anybody who has a transfer station knows that once you, you're there a lot, People come on the day that they come and they come at the time that they come and that's when they want their, their questions answered. Okay, next slide. So um, these are just a couple of different things that we, um, different sort of messaging um, that we put out there. So that's on the right is a trash talk flyer that um, we use a QR code to register so that we knew how many people were gonna be there. Um, we could get an indication of whether we needed to keep advertising in the days before, or if we already had, you know, 85, 100 people, that we were in pretty good shape. Um, we also sort of um, coined the term, I'm taking the challenge. And again, that was a Jen Heaton Jones thought up that uh, term. And we had the orange bags. And I, I don't know if those are typical, but we had... Um, and still have orange bags so that our um, transfer station folks can do sort of a visual audit in the containers to see, to make sure people are using the bags. And we also offered people to have an organics only um, because some people wanted to keep their curbside. They didn't want to home compost because we have a um, the bears are part of our community here in Kent. Um, and people are nervous about, um, some people are nervous about home composting. And when we started to talk to people who home compost about commercial composting, where you can't put bones, you can't put cheese rinds, you can't, there's a lot of things you can't put in a home compost pile because it can't get hot enough. Um, those were more of those aha moments. And so we did have um, some people who converted, some longtime home composters that converted to uh, bringing their compost down to the transfer station. Um, so we, we haven't sold a lot of the organics only, but it was interesting because one place we did sell it was to a small um, subsidized senior housing called Templeton Farms. And they actually share, they have a little toter that they share because they're not creating a lot of composting. So they all put their organic materials in this one little toter and then they um, sort of revolve around who takes it to the transfer station because there's a bunch of folks um, who either have their regular permits or um, just like to go to the transfer station because it's a fun place to go. <laughs> uh, you can go to the last slide. So I always like to end with a joke. Um, <laughs> so just in summary, never underestimate the power of collaboration. This could not have been done if I was sitting at my desk in town hall and, you know, thinking up this by myself, because I never would have hit all of the, the devil is in the details stuff that Jen, Tiffany, Rick, my administrative assistant, Joyce, a lot, a lot of people in town all brought to the table to collaborate to make this happen and successful. Um, again, the omni-channel messaging is so key to reaching all the residents. We have a small town, there's only 3,019 people in the town, but we have a, a large number of seniors and many of them are not on social media. Many of them rely on the Waterbury Republican. So we made sure that we were doing press releases. We made sure that we were in touch with our local reporter to say, hey, we're going to launch on this day. Why don't you come down and, you know, do a little 
you know, take some photos. Every step of the way, we were making sure that we were hitting as many um, of those messaging channels that we possibly could. It was in a lot of our newsletters. Um, so I would say those those are the two big um, sort of takeaways from to to make a successful program. And that is all. I am all set. Thank you so much, Dean, for your presentation. That was amazing. And I have the honor of introducing Kim O'Rourke, who works as the Recycling Program Coordinator for the City of Middletown. She's led the city's waste reduction, recycling, reuse, and composting efforts for over 30 years. Kim is currently managing multiple food scrap composting and diversion efforts, and has led the effort to reduce waste by over 30% in the city's sanitation district. She's an avid co composter and has hands-on experience with backyard composting, community composting, and vermicomposting, and is also a certified Yukon Master Composter. And also just a reminder to please put any questions you have for Kim in the chat, and those will be answered after. And thank you so much for joining us today, Kim, and I will pass it off to you. All right, thanks for having me. Um, I am going to briefly review uh, Middletown's, give an overview of Middletown's programs. I am going to uh, try to be as brief as possible because I think we're starting to run out of time. Is That's correct, right? Um, okay, so uh, next slide would be good. In, uh, I'll start with our residential programs. I will say in Middletown, our programs are always evolving and we focus on trying to make them sustainable, long lasting, stable funding. Um, I've been here a long time. I've done a lot of pilots and quite honestly, I'm kind of tired of pilots. I wanna make the program uh, fit in the system, in the solid waste system. Um, so that it stays. It doesn't always work out, but that's how we try. So we, uh, we have for decades done a lot of education on home composting. I wanna give a shout out to the Yukon Master uh, Composting Program. They're actually, uh, it's an excellent program to learn about all types of backyard composting. Uh, highly recommend it. It's actually out now. Their program starts in September and uh, definitely worth looking into if you're interested in learning about the science of composting and all different ways to do it. Um, there's lots of benefits to home composting, I, and I won't go into the types of outreach and education that we do, but the limitations with it is that it's it's always done on a voluntary basis not it's not for everybody and we it, it, this isn't a horrible thing but as a solid waste manager we like to track the material and we can't really track the material from home, home composting um but it's uh, definitely a big part of our educational program here in middletown so the next uh let's go to the next slide we and uh Jen definitely talked about this and Jean, we have food waste drop-offs in Middletown, one at our transfer station and one in the south end of town. Uh, and then we uh, have collected food scraps at our farmer's market. We have had, we, we've been doing this since 2018 and now uh, we've had minimal contamination with these drop-offs and they're just carts out uh, in, our south, in our south end area. They're available 24 seven, which people really like. And um, they've been very popular. Now they're popular, but realistically only probably one to 2% of our population use them. So again, they're uh, voluntary. Uh, they are an additional expense to the city too. We have two different systems in Middletown for our waste. The most of the city is serviced by private haulers. So it's uh, the cost of running these drop-offs comes out of our general budget. We would love to do additional drop-offs specifically in the west end of town. And then we're also looking at possibly um, getting into the metro store the lot the locked big belly containers in uh in more areas it, it, it it's something the city is exploring now i i, I just do want to emphasize we haven't had a big problem with contamination at these at these sites and knock on wood we don't we've been very lucky we haven't had bears we haven't you know over the seven eight years that we've done this we've had maybe 
three times that someone has dumped garbage in these uh, was significant garbage in these sites. So to me, that's a pretty good record. But I do feel like uh, it's always a concern. So I know a lot of communities are looking at the lock containers, and it's something that we are exploring as well, maybe hoping to have more of them in different neighborhoods. But again, it's an additional cost to the city, and it's not really sustainable if we don't have the funding for it. So something we're trying to, to figure out. We, we need a stable funding source from somewhere to pay for those. Uh, collections. Now, for us, the big program we've done the last couple of years, we can go to the next slide, is our co-collection program. And this is through a deep grant. Um, we're one of the sustainable materials management grant recipients. We have been doing co-collection and unit-based pricing in our sanitation district. And this is where residents have to use uh, certain bags for trash. And then we have orange bags for trash, green bag for food scraps. Both those bags go in the trash container. And then we can go to the next slide. Um, and then that container gets picked up. It was no change for our trucks. This was done in our city service sanitation district. So it's city crews that are picking these up. And then uh, we take that to the facility. It gets dumped. This is one of our early pictures. So th this was during the original pilot. So it's not, uh, it, it, it's not ideal, but um, I, I just see a lot of white and black bags that has changed over time. And then the green bags get sorted out and they go to the anaerobic digester. Um, so this program, and I'd be happy to talk to anybody about it who's interested. Uh, the, the benefits of this have been significant. It's convenient for residents. They don't have to bring their food scraps anywhere. They don't have to wait for the transfer station to be open. They can just put it right in their curbside trash cart, which in Middletown is the, everybody has to have a curbside trash cart for service. We do not have a drop off for MSW. So it's convenient and it's cost effective because it's not having a separate truck going around and collect. Um, combined with, so it is combined with unit-based pricing, which has had a significant impact on our waste stream. It has saved us money. It has allowed us to offer the co-collection. We've reduced waste by over 30%. We uh, have had people recycling more, diverting other waste streams to other areas. We had a lot of people putting brush in their carts and the unit-based pricing kind of opened their eyes as to, oh, you know, yeah, you're not supposed to do that and they don't want to pay to get rid of it so they they actually figure out how to get rid of it correctly um we've diverted over a hundred thousand almost probably at this point over a hundred thousand pounds of food scraps in less than a year we've saved about a hundred thousand um dollars in tip fees and it it's the system so the thing that i really like about this is it is built this, this is the way the system works. We don't have to rely on grants. Uh, we don't have to worry about yeah, the, the future. It's the, the people pay for what they dispose. So uh, they've always paid a trash bill in Middletown. So now they pay for what they dispose. Those who dispose less pay less. Those who dispose more pay more. Uh, it's been much fairer to those people who recycle right and reduce their waste. Um, so we've been very happy with that. The challenges is uh, uh, it, changing behavior is really hard. And uh, that, that, uh, I, that, that has been a challenge in that we've had a small group of people in Middletown who, who really hate this for various reasons and um, are very vocal about it. Uh, the logistics also is something that we had to um, we had to deal with, and in Connecticut, we for this to move forward, we have to make sure we have the infrastructure to continue this uh, co collection program. And it, in Connecticut, unit based pricing is is new and different. Um, and I have heard many people, you know, they just don't want to be responsible for the trash. And like what Jean said with electricity, you wouldn't pay for somebody else's electricity. Why would you pay for someone else's trash? But it, um, overall, we've been, this program has been very successful. We have some great statistics on how much waste we have reduced and how much money we have saved. 
Um, and then on the, we have had some people who don't like putting the food scraps, and this was interesting to me, they don't like putting the food scraps in their carts, they rather take it to a drop off so they can get rid of it um, uh, right away so that it's not sitting in their cart. And, and, and so that's why in Middletown we do like to offer options for people. Um, uh, and I will say this trash is a hot button issue for people. Um, everybody generates trash. Everybody has an opinion about trash and everybody thinks they're an expert on trash. So uh, when you start talking about making people be responsible for uh, the amount of trash that they generate, it tends to get very emotional. Uh, that's a, okay. Let's go to the next one because I know we're struggling for time. Commercial. We have a great commercial, and I should have put school programs in here as well. We we've been uh, collecting from restaurants and schools since 2021. We work with Blue Earth Compost. It's within our system, so as part of our sanitation district collection. Uh, it includes trash. It includes uh, food scraps, and it includes recycling. Um, I, 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 I won't get into the details of it, but uh, the benefits, we've col collected over a million pounds of food scraps since its inception. It's easy for restaurants to do. They just put the food scraps in a different container and it's very sustainable because it's how the system works. Uh, it is voluntary and there is no requirement to do it. So I, I do feel the participation is low because of that. And it's something that we are looking at. Okay, next slide. Um, we collect food scraps at several events and I, I won't go into the details on that. And last slide, um, moving forward, like uh, the main message I wanna give here is that we need to work to make organics diversion part of the system. It's just the way it works. And for that to happen, we need stable funding because it does cost money. And we could use stronger straight policy and support from our uh, legislative body to, um, to give us the, the backup that we need as municipalities. And I'll end it there. I have a contact information on the last slide. <laughs> it's like a, a Zoom, a Zoom presentation there. Thank you for sticking with me. Awesome. Thank you, Kim, so much. That was amazing. Uh, before we get to the Q&A, just wanted to shout out some additional resources Sustainable CT offers related to organics waste aversion. Of course, we got our community match fund. Uh, this is a crowdfunding program where we will match the amount that your project is able to crowdfund uh, up to $7,500. It's a great way to kind of gauge like, you know, how the community is invested in certain projects, you know, a great way for a smaller projects to kind of get off the ground. Of course, organic waste diversion is also a sustainable CT action. And with all our actions, we uh, list uh, additional resources and funding opportunities. So definitely, you know, on our website, if you go to action 9.4.2, you'll see some additional links and resources there. And like I said, the fellows made some amazing fact sheets. So if you'd like to read more into certain uh, town projects across the state, those should be available soon. And if you have any questions, definitely feel free to reach out to us at in, uh, info at sustainablect.org. So uh, without further ado, we can get into our, into our Q&A session here. Um, Odette, I'll turn it over to you. Great, thank you so much. And thank you to the presenters and the fellows for doing this awesome presentation. I know we are short on time, so we'll go till 11.05, just to kind of summarize a bit of the questions we had. Um, from my point, the composting initiatives that the fellow did won't be available on the website. Um, that's not something where you can currently share publicly, but if you are interested in learning more, contact info at sustainablect.org. And we also got a question about how many towns are funding on the town budget and about 14 out of the 39 projects we found out were town budgeted, town funded. Um, and Kim kind of answered, has there been any experience with illegal dumping and dumping of household waste into publicly ac accessible containers? I don't know if uh, Jen or Jean wanted to add to this. No, we don't have any issues and my 14 municipality is on illegal dumping because of these programs. Beautiful. And another question we got in the chat 
is for Jennifer, how does the weather influence the maintenance of the ideal components of the compost pile, like rain, snow, ice, or wind? Uh, no impact. When you have density in your compost pile, even if you're a home composter or a large commercial size industry, industrial size, that's what's the most important. It's, it's not the weather. It's not even the sun that's warming up your pile. It's the microorganisms inside the pile. And uh, when you have a, the biofilter uh, layer, it's protecting what's happening inside. So you can continue to maintain your level of temperature even in the cold days in January, and whether it's snowing or ice or rain. Perfect. And just to let everybody know as well that the presentation will be made available. So if you had any questions regarding the size of the grant or the cost, that will all be available to you as well. And we had another question. Aside from the Community Match Fund and federal government, what other sources of funding are out there? Jess has put in a link in the chat about our external grants that are available. Um, the next questions are for Jean. How do you pay for your trash volume? And how do the people in Kent realize that the food scrap save? How do they realize savings as they throw? And were their taxes reduced? So um, what was the first question again? We'll go one at a time. Sorry. Yeah, sorry about that. That's first okay. question was, how do you pay for your trash volume? So um, some people do curbside, so it's private hall or curbside. Um, the folks who want to use the transfer station, they um, we do have a permit fee, an annual permit fee, which was reduced this year now that we have the program um, as a permanent program. And then the rest is supported through taxes. But we have about, I want to say 680 um, permittees in of, you know, for residents in town. And we're part of HRA and we have a great tipping fee <laughs> um, being part of that um, larger authority really leverages it to make, make that um, a bit affordable. Uh, if I can just add on to that, um, Rick has been great, the transfer station operator at the Kent Transfer Station, and we have a board up for where folks are pulling in and dropping off their orange bags, part of the Page You Throw program, and where they drop off their organics to say, to date, we've diverted X amount of tons. So as of today, August 15th, the town of Kent has diverted 25 tons. It's a very small community with 680 residents, and this, this is a 12 month uh, into the program. That's a significant waste diversion. So uh, 25 tons of food scraps have been collected and we've reduced the municipal solid waste volume by 41 tons. So we've seen a significant um, change in behavior from this program. And they're able to see that and they see that in the cost, in the um, savings of they're not paying $150 flat fee every year to use the transfer station, but they start out with $50 and they can con control their cost by buying those orange bags. Which is really impactful because we have so many um, seniors that live in town who are using the transfer station and they may be living by themselves. They may be living just, um, it's just them and their husband or wife and their empty nesters in comparison to a family of six or a family of four, three. So the fact that they see that when they pay for their permit has been impactful on a personal level to people, which is huge <laughs> in getting compliance. Great, thank you very much. Again, I know yeah. we are out of time, but I know the presenters have included their contact info in the chat, and you can also reach us at info at sustainability.org for more questions.